Okay, so hello everyone. Welcome to today's online artist talk as part of the Glucksman's exhibition, Home, Being and Belonging in Contemporary Ireland. Uh, my name is Ty Crowley and I'm the Senior Curator for Education and Community here at the Museum. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined today by artist Eileen Hutton, whose work New Season Nesting Boxes is currently on display here at the Glucksman. Um, so Eileen Hutton is a visual artist whose practice aims to regenerate, to generate reciprocal relationships within the natural environment. Specifically, Eileen is interested in the critical role that honeybees and birds play within ecosystems, and she has built various artificial habitats in order to support them and the surrounding biodiversity. Eileen's studio practice involves traditional artist methods such as small scale construction, installation, fiber techniques, photography and community based workshops as well. Uh, more recently Eileen's work has expanded to include interactive and participatory elements and social practice methodologies. Uh, so we'll be hearing from Eileen and she'll delve into this in a little bit more detail. Uh, some of Eileen's solo exhibitions include Between, a participatory intervention at Innes Street Arts Festival in Clare in 2018, The Birds, the Bees, the Burn in Siemsa Tierra in County Kerry in 2013, and Being in the Land, a sculptural investigation of ecology at the Byrne College of Art in 2012. Group exhibitions include Voicing the Bridge, the Finnish Institute of London Award at Claddy, Encountering the Land, Visual Carlo in 2018, uh, Lost and Found at the Hal Brom Gallery, New York in 2013. And of course, as part of the group exhibition at the Glucksman at the moment, Home, Being and Belonging in Contemporary Ireland. Uh, today's talk is made possible with the support of the Arts Council of Ireland and University College Cork. Uh, now, Eileen has kindly recorded her presentation for today, which we will now play after which we'll come back here live for a Q&A with Eileen. Uh, and if you have any questions, just pop them in the chat or Q&A uh, sections, and we'll endeavor to get to all of them at the end. Uh, so for now, uh, we will move over to Eileen's talk. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eileen Hutton. Firstly, thank you to Chris and Fiona for inviting me to give this uh, online talk today. Uh, and for everybody, who's joined us here virtually. So I think I'll, I'll jump right in. Um, if I were to give a, a brief kind of synopsis of my practice, it would be that it centers on the notion of ecology in the broadest sense um, as a study of relationships between the human and the more than human world and the interconnectedness of the beings and life that exist within the natural world. Through my work, uh, I aim to generate a reciprocal relationship with the natural environment. Um, and specifically for me, that means building purpose-built habitats, such as nesting boxes or beehives, um, and trying to build sculptures uh, with the, those organisms that live inside of those um, habitats. Um, more recently, the practice has extended to thinking about um, soil and fungi and earthworms. Um, there's very much an element of trying to find or to make visible the invisible um, and the relationships that exist um, within our surrounding environment. Uh, the first slide I have here is, is kind of a, a diagrammatic overview of the, I suppose, the core tenets that inform my practice or, you know, kind of provides a, a framework of sorts. Um, I've, the kind of hexagonal cells are, are quite segmented, um, although I don't really see my practice that way. Uh, I do see these boundaries as being quite fluid, quite porous. Um, but I, I, I put this up um, as a way to kind of maybe tether uh, this conversation and that I can kind of, uh, as I, over the next few minutes, as I show you, um, or describe these works that I can kind of dip in and out of these ideas. Um, but that, yeah, for me visually, this provides kind of a, a nice overview. So I should start by saying that a lot of my practice um, stems from, or is kind of made within my studio, away from the studio, which is uh, Mullet Greenland Woods. Uh, in, in County Kildare. I live just across from the woods, so it, 
kind of um, very serendipitously within my 5k. Um, and I'm, I'm showing this, this overview image um, in particular because, you know, A, it's a, it's a Google map and then there's kind of a, a survey, an ordinance map laid over the top of it. Um, and I, I think it's interesting these ways, these, you know, these tools that we are given to start to know or understand the landscape. Um, and I'm interested in the ideologies that are, are passed down with these kind of ways of knowing um, and how they become familiar, how, how these ways of kind of seeing the landscape become quite familiar. So yeah, with my practice, I'm, I'm interested in um, kind of interrogating those traditional ways, in quotes, um, of knowing or understanding the landscape. Um, and as that was kind of pointed out in that framework, um, I do kind of approach my practice through an eco-phenomenological lens um, as a way to be quite present in my practice, um, I, as a way to start to dig a little bit deeper, to be fully present, to be, to be engaged. And then of course within um, the discourse of artistic practice, um, probably one of the most recognizable frameworks that we have for depicting the natural world is romantic landscape painting or photography. Um, these scenes of the pastoral, um, scenes of the transcendent and sublime. Um, and if I'm, I suppose if I'm, I'm being frank, I'm, I'm just as seduced by those images um, as anybody. Uh, this scene is actually just at the edge of Mullet Rita Mullet. Um, overlooking a few different farms. So I'd like to give you just an overview of kind of where this practice exists for me, um, just to locate you virtually. Um, so this is the entryway, I kind of come through a gate and then there's this kind of um, birch hall of trees almost. And then that's that um, in the autumn time, in the springtime, yeah, kind of coming into summer with the bluebells. And yeah, even for me, these, those images, which would be kind of, um, you know, I, I think fall into that traditional category of kind of the romantic, um, the idealized version of the natural world. Um, I, I still take them, They're, they are important to my practice to kind of try and document things and draw, document this place. Um, but another one of the ways in which um, I, I try to be present, you know, is, is finding the smaller things, the overlooked. Again, that phrase, you know, making um, visible the invisible. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump then into a next kind of three short videos. Um, this first video was um, made during, a, was made, was part of Home From Home, the online exhibition that happened during our first lockdown um, when we were all kind of allocated to our 5K zone. Um, so I was, I was just taking these, these videos of these small creatures um, that live in the woods just with my, uh, with my camera phone. They were only about, um, the initial ones were maybe 10 to 20 seconds each. Um, of you might be questioning how I'm giving such um, excellent recording at such a level. Now I'll, I'll fill you in in a second. Oh, <laughs> 
So it, it might have become a little bit more obvious from that last um, video that the sounds are, are not the actual sounds that the animal is making, but they are human sounds. Um, so we, I, I made these um, when my son was about 19 months old uh, and still walking in the woods, still taking daily walks. Um, and I had him kind of tucked into a sling, either trying to get him to go to sleep or just to kind of settle him down. Um, and yeah, I felt like uh, that whole period of time, um, we, I had just kind of come to know Mullet Breathing Woods. We had just moved across there about a year ago. So I was trying, I was getting to know this place and then kind of simultaneously then getting to, I suppose, understand what it meant to be um, a mother and caring for this small infant and what that meant for my practice. And so, yeah, kind of these, these short little videos, these chunks of time were nearly all I could I could get as a new mom um, and it also became a way for me to kind of slow down to be very present um, to um, yeah really look at these these small creatures that maybe I would have moved too quickly past um, so I was recording um, these noises that my son was making um, it was really surprising to me how noisy he was as a newborn um, and these kind of sounds, these unexpected sounds um, were coming out of him. You know, it wasn't just kind of the gooby, the, you know, the cooing or the gurgling, these really kind of grunts and raspy pants and these high-pitched peeps. Um, and I found it, I found it really, really strange. Um, so the idea was kind of overlaying these sounds onto the videos, reimagining um, this kind of maybe a speculative fiction of sorts, um, these otherworldly sounds of, of what these tiny creatures um, in the woods could could be could be making um, kind of conflating the the domestic and and the wild of sorts so uh, the next um, kind of quick series of works that I want to show you um, just as a way to give context to the work um, that's on exhibition at the moment um, along again at the same time during these walks um, again noticing the small um, and, and starting to notice the thinking about the marks the traces that I'm leaving within this woodland um, and looking for evidence of other traces that um, other insects or animals are making um, so this image of this insect on the right uh, is, a, is a leaf miner and a leaf miner is actually um, any number of insects that lay eggs on the underside of a leaf. And when the grub hatches out of the egg, they eat the leaf tissue. And they leave these really beautiful traces um, on the underside of the leaf. So I was thinking about these paths, these traces, the impact that we have um, in our surrounding environment. Um, and then the, the traces that these other um, other species leave. So I started to uh, take uh, a GPS trace of these walks that my son and I were making, um, thinking about how we're moving through the woods, um, 
some of them, this was actually taken at a later stage when he was more of a toddler. You can kind of see this, this rambling and this moving back and forth, this, this kind of erratic patterning. Um, and thinking about, yeah, conflating those, um, those tracings with the tracings of the leaf miner. So this was, um, this leaf is a honeysuckle leaf. So I was scanning the images in, and then overlaying um, the drawings um, from that we were making, we were tracing as part of our walk. And at the same time, I was reading um, Rebecca Solnit, uh, Wanderlust, and some of the, like, I think maybe everything that she writes is, is a gem, but some of the um, sentences that she was writing really stuck out to me. Uh, and if you'll bear with me, I just want to read just a quick three sentences. So she says, walking itself is the intentional act closest to the unwilled rhythms of the body, to breathing and the beating of the heart. It strikes a delicate balance between working and idling, being and doing. It's a bodily labor that produces nothing but thoughts, experiences, arrivals. Walking allows us to be in our bodies and in the world without being made busy by them. And it leaves us free to think without being wholly lost in our thoughts. So for me, that was, it was really interesting. It's kind of describing this kind of liminal place, this liminal place of being. Um, and it, it very much reflected my experience um, as a, as a new mother and um, trying to find my feet. Um, and, it, you know, in, in this role as a mother and my role as an artist and, and in trying to locate myself, literally locate myself in this new place that we had moved to. So this leaf is, um, I believe, from Hazel. And again, it's some of the some of the patterns are quite intricate, and then others are these kind of small traces that kind of trail out at the end. And then this was a blackberry leaf, and I hadn't realized when I when I scanned the leaf um, that there was actually a small um, now this this little tiny moth, this insect that had gotten scanned alongside that. Um, but the, I suppose this work kind of leads into this, um, the work that, that's uh, on show at the Gluckson at the moment. Um, and for me, this is this kind of, this conflating or that finding these parallels between, um, you know, human ways of making and creating um, the kind of the ways that the more than human world makes or creates or leaves evidence of their being and kind of you know juxtaposing the two. So for the work at the Glexman, um, I proposed that I would install four nesting boxes on site um, and within each of those nesting boxes um, place a small fiber sculpture into the nesting box that the birds could then hopefully build a nest within. Um, as a sculptor, I first became interested in the potentiality that I could build or sculpt with uh, more than human species, um, and in, in particular priority species. So in this case, small birds who can be either threatened um, uh, due to climate change, uh, shifting pa seasonal patterns um, and then kind of fluctuating food sources can have a, have a big impact on small birds. Um, and yeah, I was, I was, I suppose, moved by the idea originally that I could collaboratively create sculpture um, with another species. Um, that, and then that, that, that sculpture could reflect that, that type of relationships. Um, so small birds, uh, in this case blue tits, um, often build and then do so within purpose-built habitats, such as nesting boxes. Um, and for me, that offers a potential to develop a, a collaborative practice of sorts. Um, my role, I see my role within this process, to borrow from Jacob Metcalf, as an intimacy without proximity. Um, or in the words of Donna Haraway, um, a presence that avoids disturbing the critters that animate the project. It still allows me 
the potential for being part of the work and of the play. Um, so the the wood itself, again, like I, you know, to reiterate what I've already said, I am very much interested in, in the interconnectedness of things. Um, so where the materials are coming from, where they're sourced, um, is very important to me. Uh, so I started by sourcing wood from the Liz Naba Timber Project. Um, it's a timber pro um, an estate that has kind of, um, I suppose, revitalized itself, has a number of businesses kind of operating through it. Um, and one of them is the Timber Project. So originally it began, um, they were linking in with other estates who had fallen um, trees and they were kind of identifying, locating, um, and then milling and planing these huge trunks. Um, they, yeah, they talk about um, each log has a full traceability report um, and a photograph of the tree where the wood came from, explaining why the tree came down and what was done to replace it and where it grew. So I found that really interesting, that level of kind of care and attention to the sourcing of the wood. Um, and then for me, the, I, I was choosing the spalted beech. The spalting is a, a term that's used to describe a process where fungi grow on dead or fallen trees. Um, and then after colonizing the wood, so the black kind of um, forms that you're seeing is actually um, what's called, what are called zone lines. So different species of fungi create, they erect barriers as such around their particular area of where they're going to start to colonize and decompose the wood. So it's this, this kind of, um, I suppose, symbiotic process, you know, that the, the fungi and the tree would have had, uh, well, a certain type of fungi would have had this um, a mycorrhizal relationship uh, with the tree, exchanging nutrients and sources. And, and so then once the tree has fallen, a different type of fungi comes in and starts to decompose. Um, obviously, if this was left, it would decompose and enrich the soil. Um, but if the tree is harvested, milled, and dried at a certain time, then you're left with that kind of that marbling process. Um, so for me, visually, that is really reflective of this kind of interconnectedness of the natural world. Um, very evident, very kind of striking in that sense. So here are a few of the nesting boxes that were put up. They're quite tiny uh, when you see them on, on these, uh, these beautiful old trees. And then for me, within, within the nesting box, um, I wanted to dye a uh, sheep school. Um, so this fiber sculpture, um, this is a, these are a few of the kind of the test dyes that I was making. Um, and then in, I'm holding in my hand um, oak galls. So that was one of the dyes that I used. Um, and again, this kind of process of interrelationship, the, the gall wasp will lay its, um, its egg in usually a young oak sapling, and the oak's response then is to kind of build this almost tumor-like structure around the, the egg, and it acts as a protection. Um, it's almost like a, a defensive reaction from the tree, but it acts as a kind of a shell of sorts to protect that wasp um, larva. And then as the larva develops and hatches, it eats the interior of that and then eats its way out of the gall. Um, but it's, it's used um, to make really beautiful dark brown um, dye. You can kind of see that. It's this coffee colored one at the bottom. So this is an example of two of the sculptures that were in, um, that were inside the box. So for me, the idea of kind of knitting or, you know, um, forming this structure to hold a bird's nest stemmed from questioning the intentionality and the processes of my practice. And this felt obligation of stewardship, um, Maria Pugh de la Bella Casa kind of states um, very eloquently this quote, desire to ground care as an ethical, effective everyday doing that is vital to engage with the inescapable, inescapable troubles of interdependent existences. So, you know, how, how, how do we start to move through or reconcile our relationship within 
you know, within this changing climate, what actions can we take? Um, for me, uh, you know, it's, it's important that these, this kind of foundational processes of my practice are replicable. You know, anybody can put up a nesting box. Um, and as I'll talk about later, you know, keeping bees and things like that, that, that is accessible. It's not instant, you know, it's not impossible task to do these things. Um, and then they, they do have that, I think collectively, those small actions do have impact. Um, but for me, these, these fiber sculptures act as a foundational layer of woolly insulation, um, very practically, um, a physical and metaphorical object of care, um, a looped string figure, uh, that acknowledges the, an entangled multi-species becoming. So this, you know, the, it is very much um, existing in both realms of the kind of practical um, environmental intervention, but then also an artistic um, intervention, a collaboration. Um, so this was just a few weeks ago, the, the B&E crew were helping to take down um, the nesting boxes and many thanks to uh, Gary and Barry for putting them up and then taking them down uh, and then putting them back up again um, the things you do for art I suppose right guys uh, and this it's interesting I've, I've been putting up these nesting boxes for about 12 years now and I would say two uh, two thirds of the time they are actually inhabited so it could have swung either way, really, with um, putting out four nesting boxes. Could have been three, um, could have been two, uh, and it wound up being two. Uh, and, and one of the things I thought was lovely, one of the ones that was left um, uninhabited by the blue tits was actually taken up by a spider. You can see it's kind of cradled in there, this lovely web, and then these two egg sacs hanging from the ceiling. So it did, you know, um, on a smaller scale, wind up being habitat of sorts for another creature. So these are the um, final sculptures. Um, you can see I've placed them again on that spotted beach. Um, we put the two together. There was a little bit of, um, it was as if one of the birds had attempted to start nesting in this one, um, and then I maybe got distracted or chose another location. Um, but these two are, are what I would kind of consider, consider more final finished pieces. Um, and for me, these works exist um, as a final kind of sculptural collaboration, um, the result of a voluntary participation or non-participation um, on the bird's parts, um, because they do, they do decide, you know, they first assess the location, um, they determine if the positioning of the nesting box is appropriate, um, they carefully inspect the interior, the exterior to just de determine its suitability. Um, other things come into play, such as, um, you know, they're very territorial. They would need to know that there's going to be enough food should they rear a brood. Um, then they spend about a few weeks gathering materials, moss, feathers, um, you can see in this case, um, hair, etc., to build the nest inside the jumper or inside this fiber sculpture. Um, and then it, it is important that at the end of the nesting season, once the, the birds fledge, you give them enough time, making sure that they don't live in the box, they don't inhabit the box once the nest has, once the fledglings have left. Um, but the, the box does have to be cleared out. So that's where these are coming from. You know, that the, the nesting box, if it's going to be a viable habitat for the next season, they have to be cleared out because they'll become infested with mites, um, leaves, other spiders, slugs, and they, they'll just, because it is organic matter, they will start to decompose quite rapidly. So this is one of the nest um, sculptures. I believe this one was made, um, the dye for the fiber sculpture was made uh, with uh, sorrel. And this was, this was dyed with blackberry. Um, yeah, and although I think like the birds and I do share an ultimate goal, which is to build a nest inside the box in order to facilitate this, the bolstering of the population. Um, 
For me, the creation process involves relinquishing a large degree of control over the final outcome. Um, and it's in this stepping back that it kind of allows for the simultaneous convergence and juxtaposition of the human and more than human methods of creation. There's this, this, this dance of sorts, if you will. Um, for the birds, the nest functions as a sheltered environment to lay eggs and rear their young. And then when the birds abandon the nest, the nest function has been fulfilled. Uh, for me as an artist, the abandoned nest exists as an art object, uh, materially evident of the reciprocal relationship between the birds, myself, the ecology of the surrounding environment. Uh, as part of the group exhibition, um, the body of work was intended to conflate the external and internal spaces of the gallery, um, attempting to equalize and account for other species, namely birds, that make their home alongside human beings. Um, and again, using Donna Haraway's notion of making kin, seeking to materially join through sculpture the birds, the sheep, the flora, the trees, and human beings to make visible the invisible entanglement um, of what it means to live, live on this island. And you can see um, alongside these sculptures, um, I had mounted a camera previously in one of the nesting boxes with a wildlife camera. Um, so it's just kind of positioned just at the end. But for me, like watching the bird, you know, making her body transparent enough so that you can see, um, you know, the eggs underneath. Um, again, this, this small insight um, into, into something that could, you know, seemingly be insignificant. You know, how many hundreds and hundreds of thousands of birds are there in Ireland? And, you know, how frequently does this process happen? Um, but I suppose taking time to kind of notice and watch and think about what's going on here um, is really important to me. So, you know, having this kind of exterior view, this interior view, um, and then kind of the, the resulting nests alongside of that was quite important. Um, I suppose moving on then, uh, the next aspect of my practice that I, I want to talk about um, for me, then it, it becomes this, you know, kind of participatory um, pedagogical engagement. Um, so there's, you know, my initial engagement, locating myself within place, finding ways to, to engage um, through this lens of, of care and reciprocity, um, you know, and, and then there's a the resulting artwork. But then for me, it's always important to continue that conversation. Um, with other people so that these mo they are models um, that can be easily replicated. Um, I, I, am a, I lecture at Burren College of Art um, and teach an undergrad and a graduate course um, art in art and ecology. And so I, I teach a wild dyes workshop. So part of that is, is learning to forage or gathering materials in the burn um, to create plant-based dyes. Um, and we're, we're thinking really about, I suppose, the historical uses of the plants um, the potential for search, um, sourcing regenerative, regenerative materials. So how do we function as artists um, within this changing climate, you know, making, making work? What's, what's the impact? What's the carbon footprint, if you will, of our, of our practice? So this is, you know, teaching them how to give them a, an alternative way of potentially making. Um, Yes, we, we ask questions like, uh, you know, getting to know things, you know, what materials are abundant and in season, um, what are the kind of historical indigenous uses for these plants, um, can really lend an insight into particular historical practices surrounding communities. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great way to start conversations with locals. Um, you know, we've met a lot of people who've been very generous and kind of sharing how they, their family used to dye socks with particular lichen or moss and that practice of doing that. Um, and then it's also a way to ask, we ask what local folklore might be associated with the plants. Uh, and often these stories kind of point to an underlying ecological reason 
for either gathering in a particular location or not gathering at a particular time, um, which I think is really interesting. Again, it's that kind of interconnectedness of things. Um, so I, for those of you who may or may not know, that according to Irish folklore, the last day that blackberries should be eaten off the bush is September 29th, um, or I think what's also known as Michaelmas. And after it, this day it's believed that the puka or the shapeshifter fairy passes over the fruit, making it inedible, essentially defecating on the fruit. Um, but what's interesting is that ecologically, often the berries have begun to ferment by this stage um, and are susceptible to a certain type of fungi. Um, and although it could be potentially toxic for humans, they're often an essential late harvest for birds and small animals. Um, so, so things like that, kind of digging a little bit deeper, trying to get to know the landscape through through these various, um, you know, ways of these ecological lenses, um, very much a kind of an eco-phenomenological experience, um, and then trying to understand the historical, social, cultural um, ties through these plants. So, yeah, that's. Um, Maybe just show this last slide. There's us dying um, in the kitchen. Um, but it is, yeah, it's it is a way for you know to extend my practice, um, you know, and to and to bring other people into that conversation, you know, again back collectively, um, kind of thinking and making, making with a group. But it looks like I'm I'm coming just up to time here. So I'll pause this um, recording now. Um, and I'll join you virtually in just a second. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Eileen. And how are you? How are you keeping? Thank you. Good, Ty. Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Sorry, I didn't you didn't make the introduction in the beginning of the clip. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for having this conversation with me today. Fascinating stuff. Now, we will hopefully have some questions popping into the chat uh, and people will have the opportunity to ask you some questions. Um, I have to say it's been a real thrill bring, bringing people through the gallery spaces and showing them your work. Um, and I suppose that it's probably important to re reiterate to the audience here online that actually the nests have only come into the gallery in the last number of weeks. So they were they were outside for, for a long period of time. And I suppose that in a sense was building anticipation around the work and curiosity around the work for audiences and for the tours that we brought through. Um, and is that a kind of an important part of the work that you're doing is to try, I suppose, in a sense, get people to look a little bit closer and have a little bit more curiosity around their natural environment. Would that, would that be kind of an, an important part for you, Eileen? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I kind of, I can't imagine like the thrill that these wildlife photographers traveling around the world feel, but I, I do find that same sense of excitement, um, kind of just observing the smaller things that are going on in, in the surrounding, in the surrounding world. And that notion of kind of, um, the notion of cycles and life cycles within the work, you know, kind of, there's maybe an immediacy to um, how we interact with things or, you know, especially through screens and technology at, at the time, but like kind of that, that waiting and that stillness that's also involved um, in observing, you know, the being curious about your surrounding world, kind of um, linking in with those, those kind of temporalities, I think is also very important. Yeah. And you, you mentioned as well, Eileen, about uh, how you wanted to make your practice rep replicable so that actually people could feel that they, even with small gestures um, and interventions can have a much, uh, like have an impact on the, the bigger things that are happening in our environment. Um, and I wonder, I'm just gonna to touch off on, I suppose, the, your work as a researcher with uh, the Urgent Inquiry and, and how much does that work influence your practice and that type of approach? Yeah, yeah, gosh, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I, I think there's the kind of, there can be such an a sense of over overwhelm, really, um, and maybe kind of paralysis that comes along with trying to absorb, um, you know, the, the impact of climate change and how fast things are, are, are moving, um, and then functioning as an artist. So, okay, well, where, where do we 
you know, for me in particular, where do I start? How do I begin? Like, it's so monumental. Um, you know, I'm looking at the works of like, um, you know, the legacy of the Harrisons where they would be kind of hugely supported through foundational grants and, and, and interlocked with um, major communities um, over, you know, they have a legacy of 50, 60 years. Um, so how, you know, would an emerging artist begin? How can I teach my students to kind of enter in on that? Um, so for me, the, you know, with the urgent inquiry, thinking, um, you know, I, I kind of had a, a lovely backseat to watching uh, these four artists work through, you know, um, an engagement with um, a coastal area that was under threat. Um, specifically, we were thinking, they were thinking about biodiversity and how to engage um, in that sense. So it was a way for me to kind of step back and watch, I, I suppose, to see how, you know, what are, what are the frameworks that are guiding and informing these practices. Um, Johan Rockstrom talks about, um, you know, these, these uh, planetary boundaries and not moving past these planetary boundaries and how we can start to set back. So having a, a, a broader framework, thinking about biodiversity, climate change, uh, soil erosion and things like that, was really interesting and then how as artists then they work in through that so maybe for um yeah for for my brain it can help to kind of compartmentalize things or to to give classifications to things to start to understand how we enter into this conversation and how we make impact um and then for me it's kind of take the first step you know like i i, I know people are interested and they want to care you know they do care they want to be involved but how, how do they do that you know um and you, I think you do have to start local. It's probably very cliche, but you have to start in your immediate environment. And it's, it's this kind of collectivity that's going to be the title change. You know, it's not gonna be necessarily one person that's gonna radically shift things. Yeah, we certainly saw, I mean, with the, the groups of various ages and people from all backgrounds, who we brought through the gallery and, and looking at your work and was sparked a curiosity about the wider environment uh, of the lower grounds and what was happening in that space. And I hope um, and imagine they brought that curiosity back to their own homes and their own environments. So um, it certainly it seemed to um, capture the imagination of the visitors that saw your work here in the government. I have, um, I've got a few other questions up my sleeve, but I'm going to move across because we have a question in the chat there, Eileen. Um, uh, just, I was wondering if the nest boxes will be installed year after year, or was it just for this nesting season? So actually the kind of timing of the exhibition is kind of important around that as well. Perhaps you mentioned this, I missed it, but that's from Vanya, so thanks Vanya. So just um, around, I suppose, the, the nest boxes, will they be installed year after year? Have you plans for them beyond the exhibition, Eileen? No, I, I suppose that's definitely, um, you know, the, the Glucksman's located within the UCC campus, so that would be up to the b and &E. Um, but it's, it is interesting when I was kind of citing, there are other uh, purpose-built habitats um, in and around the campus. There's one for bats um, kind of down by the river. And then there's another, there's a few different insect habitats, you know, the, like the little wooden structures with the bamboo and the twigs kind of setting up around. So it was nice to kind of feel, you know, contributing to those habitats that are already established there. Um, but yeah, I don't know if they'll stay up. And, and have you, you tr have tr installed uh, nesting boxes in different locations, Eileen, or is it you, I, you were, I suppose, had, a, had a, uh, some sort of level of confidence that it would work here in UCC? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, um, I, ha I have installed them before. Um, there are a number of them in the Burren, um, and then a number in Kildare. So yeah, over the period of 12 years, and but I, I didn't have any confidence. It was a real, um, it was a, it was a big gamble. I think Chris um, and Mark were there with the beanie guys when we were taking down uh, the nesting boxes. My heart was slamming in my chest. It, it's been almost two years since I brought the nesting boxes down, and then we had COVID, so they didn't go up the first year. And I was like, this is such a gamble. I what am I what am I doing? <laughs> you know, but like that's that's also it. Like it doesn't it doesn't work out. You can't. Con control can't dictate um you know if if even if you have the 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 best most architecturally superior nesting box in the right location you know it, it's up to the birds they may or may not decide to nest there so it is that that relinquishing of control you know as nerve-wracking as it can be it is that's important for me to kind of recognize you know my place within this that i might offer <laughs> you know um 
you know, a, a, an invitation, but it, it might not be taken up. Um, and I suppose that's the, the nature of all collaborations as well. But we were quite confident because we saw some birds flying into one of the nest boxes. We were confident that one <laughs> would, would be successful. Um, the, and I suppose that, that building that anticipation was something that we saw with our visitors here as well. Um, there's another question after coming through, Eileen, and just, I suppose, around um, your work, um, around uh, the eco art network um, and your contributing to that. Maybe you could expand a little bit on that, that work that you're doing. Yeah, um, so yeah, the, the eco art network is kind of a, a worldwide group of um, mostly like ecologically minded artists, but there's also a lot of scientists that are involved. Um, and it, it, it operates as a, a listserv basically. So kind of sharing, you know, emails back and forth and resources and kind of digging in deeper with few issues or, you know, referencing exhibitions. Um, and I think it was maybe three years ago or so, um, there would be a lot of educators uh, on the list and even as artists. And uh, it was proposed by a number of the members to put together um, a book um, around eco art and pedagogy. And yeah, the, it's going to be published uh, in February, 2020, or sorry, 22, 2022. Uh, it's a mouthful, um, but yeah. So mine, mine again is looking at I suppose what I'm, what I was talking about. That you know, trying to be very transparent with my pedagogical practice. So this is how I go about this. Um, particularly the wild dives workshops. What questions I ask, how it moves. You know, the the students are. I'm asking them to really question um, their practice, the carbon footprint, the life cycle of the materials that they're using, and then to come up or research an alternative way of making in their studio. So it's, it's quite open-ended, but I kind of give a framework for how to approach that project um, and then a workshop that can be run alongside it, you know, and, and very much tied into the landscape, um, you know, the, the historical, cultural um, ideologies that are embedded, looking at, you know, mostly through an ecological lens, but how to dig deeper with that. Brilliant. Eileen, um, your work has brought us a lot of joy here in the Glucksman to date uh, and today's talk has been fantastic. So thank you so much. Um, we have reached our kind of time. So, um, and I think we've covered the questions that have come through. So we've done pretty good. Um, so Eileen, thank you so much. Um, the exhibition home being in belonging contemporary Ireland runs until the 31st of October. So you still have time to get down uh, and see the work here in the Glucksman. Also uh, those beautiful short films that uh, Eileen showed earlier on from home from home. The online exhibition is available on our website glucksman.org. Um, the artist talk series takes a slight break now for a few weeks and we will return on the 15th of September with artist Sarah Baum. Uh, so, um, I, usually we'd have a round of applause, Eileen, but unfortunately we're online, so we can't do that. But um, I just want to extend my sincere thanks again for, for today's talk. Uh, terribly enjoyable. So, we'll see you all soon, and thank you, Eileen. Thanks so much, Tyke.